This video is brought to you by CuriosityStream and Nebula. A toilet is basically a chair that you poop into. And you sit in it at least once a day. <laughs> there are chairs in this house I haven't sat in in months. I bet if you added all out, the toilet would be one of the top three most used chairs in this house. Huh. That's how much time I spend crapping. I spend the time in the other chairs eating. Well, that's pretty much life, isn't it? You're either eating or crapping, just stuffing food in one hole and shoving poop out the other one. We're basically just food to poop conversion machines. We literally turn everything into crap. And now we want to go to the moon and Mars. Awesome, let's spread our crap across the solar system. Yay. Somebody's going to be the first person to crap on Mars. Of course, they would have crapped a lot of times on the way over, so like four or five months to get there, that's what, like 150 or so days. If you crap at least once a day, that's 150 craps. <laughs> okay, hold on, wait. How big is the average human dump? Uh, Okay, 400 to 500 grams. Okay, so split the difference, say 450 grams times 150 days, that's 67,500 grams. That's 67.5 kilograms. I don't know, what is that in pounds? That's 148 pounds of poop just for one person. Oh, okay, wait, okay, so if, if Elon wants to take 100 people to Mars on a starship and each person takes 148 pounds of poop, that's 14,800 pounds of poop. Hang on. 7.4 tons of poop. Huh. The entire path from Earth to Mars would just be a giant skid mark. Miss me? Yeah, before I get going on this, I do want to take a minute to just thank everybody for their patience and letting me have a little time off in April uh, to sort of, you know, rejuvenate and take care of some things behind the scenes. It was good for me, and uh, I, I know a lot of you guys are, like, really super cool about it, and I do appreciate that. I've had a lot of people ask if it's, uh, you know, if it's a good idea to take that much time off, and now that I've done it, I think I can say with a little bit of certainty, uh, no, no, not, not a good idea, not worth it. Because I found that when you turn off your brain for a little bit, it starts to wander into some really um, weird places. Hence the bathroom bit. But generally that time away gave me uh, a little bit of space to think about how I can elevate this channel to, you know, a new classier level of sophistication and whatnot. So uh, let's talk about poop. Actually, astute observers of this channel probably already have recognized this from a previous video. Uh, what, are you, what are you guys working on? Uh, how astronauts poop. Uh, deadliest orgies of all time. Coyote penises. Two more to go. But for real, you know, poop may make us giggle like 10 year olds whenever we talk about it. But the fact of the matter is, when it comes to space travel, that is a real issue to contend with. Like, for example, that inspiration mission uh, that was going up. I had a lot of people asking if I was going to apply to to be on that mission to, you know, fly around in a, in a crew dragon. And, uh, and I was like, no. Not because I'm afraid of dying. Although, yeah, I mean, I'm a little bit afraid of dying, but, but really more than that, it's just the idea of pooping in front of three strangers in a tiny little capsule it doesn't sound great to me. For the record, the Crew Dragon does have a toilet. Uh, we don't know that much about it, but it is actually located at the top of the capsule behind the computer panel, so you're not just pooping right in front of your crew members, you're doing it upside down. Upside down poop, FTW. Although there is apparently a curtain you can pull down for extra privacy, but still. Also, apparently they say that weightlessness kind of disrupts your digestion cycle a little bit, so most people don't have to poop for about 24 hours uh, when they first get up there. So most of the time, people in the Crew Dragon uh, would just wait till they get to the ISS to use it. So when you see footage of the astronauts egressing the Crew Dragon and they're all hugging each other on the ISS, what they're, what they're really saying is, um, Ex excuse me, can you point me to the loo? Luckily, the loo that they're rushing toward is a brand new state-of-the-art $23 million system that was just installed at the end of 2020 called the Universal Waste Management System, or IMS. And it works like this. For number one, there's a hose with a fan in it that gently pulls away whatever liquids are expelled. Like when you pee into a toilet at home, gravity pulls the pee down into the toilet and you can direct that pee where you want it to go. But in space, you need some kind of force to direct the liquid so it doesn't go everywhere. So a gentle airflow does the job. It isn't, by the way, just a tube that leads to the vacuum of space that you attach to your genitals. That would, uh, that would be bad. 
Same general idea with the poop. The toilet has a fan that creates a general airflow. You suction your butt to the toilet, and the toilet guides the waste away into a receptacle to make sure it doesn't float away. Talk about floaters. <laughs> And in the ISS, thankfully, all of this is inside of a small closet, so you do have some actual privacy. Also, you might be looking at this toilet and you might think, that looks super uncomfortable. And yeah, if you were here on Earth sitting on something that small, it probably would be uncomfortable. But keep in mind, these, these guys are weightless and their butts are just kind of like barely pressed up against it. And the astronauts do have to train on a version of this down on Earth so that they know how to use it, obviously. And, and one of the things about it, apparently, there's a camera inside the toilet so that they can see their own... Yeah, and they can practice their docking procedure. And there are a couple of different ways that we've used to uh, guide astronauts into the docking procedure, uh, because there were a couple of different toilets on the ISS. There was a Russian toilet and an American toilet. The American toilet actually had straps around the thighs to hold them in place, but the Russian toilet just used little toe grabbers so that they would just guide themselves in with their feet. But this new UWMS toilet is actually replacing the American toilet, and they're using the Russian toe grab technique because the astronauts like that better. Another major upgrade that this toilet provides is apparently for the first time you can pee and poop at the same time. Uh, I guess in the previous ones they only had one fan, so you can only go through, have the airflow through the tube or through the, the you know, poop portal. But in this one they made it so you can do both. By the way, is it just me or does that feel like kind of a major upgrade? Like, have you ever tried to pee without pooping or vice versa? Like, just push one out while hold the other one in? That seems like some kind of superpower to me. Like, did the astronauts have to have special training in how to push and pull at the same time? Oh, and one more thing. This whole uh, pee and poop at the same time thing, they call dual ops, which is just awesome. Now, the biggest upgrade to this toilet is actually what happens after you do your business. And this is actually pretty interesting. The poop... It's, it's still pretty low rent. That, that, that receptacle that I was talking about, there's actually a bag that they place in there, and once you're done pooping, you're supposed to close up that bag, push it down to the receptacle, and then put in a new bag for the next astronaut to come along. And when that container is full, they store it away on the progress module and replace it with a new one. And eventually that progress module is then discarded and burned up in the atmosphere. Which means there are burnt up particulates and molecules in our atmosphere that were once astronaut poo you may have breathed some of it in at some point. Have you or a loved one been affected by breathing in astronaut poo? You may be entitled to compensation. Call now to get the justice you deserve. So that's what happens to the poo. It's very unceremoniously discarded. But the pee, that gets recycled. The ISS has an insane water reclamation system that not only recycles pee, but also the astronauts sweat, wastewater from bathing, and also just the water vapor from their breath. And this new universal toilet does it with really strong acid and a series of filters, including a brine filter and the urine processing assembly. And yeah, it cleans it and it gets reused. Or as NASA astronaut Jessica Meyer once said, today's coffee is tomorrow's coffee. This doesn't get a lot of attention, but it really should. Water is a precious resource in space and it's heavy, so they have to be able to reuse it without being able to recycle all the water possible on the space station. Long-term human spaceflight is just simply not possible. It's a technological innovation that mimics the Earth's water cycle and it's, it's elegant and efficient. But the poo is basically stuffed in bags and burned up in the atmosphere. NASA still doesn't really quite know what to do with the poo. In fact, it's really kind of one of the biggest issues that the astronauts have to face in space, especially when things go wrong. One person that would know better than anybody is Peggy Whitson. She's not only an astronaut, but she has more hours in space than any other American astronaut ever, period. She is a legend, she is a hero, and she says that the poop is the worst thing about being in space. In fact, she's talked in interviews about times when she had to throw on some rubber gloves and stuff it down in there because the poo receptacle got jammed because that's what heroes do. And keep in mind, this is the peak of pooping technology in space. Back in the early days of the space race, it, accidents happened. This is the full transcript of the Apollo 10 mission from May of 1969. Actually, it's not the full transcript. The full transcript would be about 500 pages long. But when you turn to page 414 on day five of the flight, lunar module pilot Gene Cernan was interrupted by Commander Tom Stafford asking, Oh, who did it? Did what? what? Who did it? Give me, a, give me a little Where did that come from? Give me a napkin quick. There's a turtle. I didn't do it. It ain't one of mine. 
I, I don't think it's one of mine. Uh, but... Mine was a little more sticky than that. <laughs> oh, <that's laughs> <the way. laughs> God almighty. <laughs> what do you see? Nothing that's enough for me. Then about eight minutes later, they have a return attack from a turd when Lunar Module pilot Gene Cernan says, Here's another goddamn turd. What's the matter with you guys? Here, give me a... <laughs> well, babe, if it was me, I'm sure you'd know I'm on the floor. <laughs> was it just floating around? Yeah. Mine was stickier than that. Mine was too. It hit that bag. When I stuck my finger in it, mine was nice and soft. God dang. <laughs> I don't know who that is. I can either claim it nor disclaim it. <laughs> to this day, by the way, none of the astronauts on board Apollo 10 have taken credit for that unidentified fecal object that was floating around the Apollo 10 capsule, and the origin of that turd remains a space mystery. That was not by any means the first bathroom mishap in space, actually. The very first American astronaut to go up into space, Alan Shepard, went up in a pea-soaked spacesuit. The flight was only about 15 minutes long, so they didn't make any accommodations for bathroom issues. According to Freeman H. Quimby of the Office of Life Science Programs at NASA at the time, quote, the first spaceman is not expected to have to go. But before this 15 minute flight, Alan Shepard sat on that pad in that capsule for five hours while they delayed on launching. And eventually he couldn't hold it anymore and he just went in his suit. And that actually shorted out his biosensors. Luckily, his suit was lined with cotton and it was dried out by the cooling system in the suit before it ever even took off. I actually talked about this in more in depth on a, on a video I did specifically about Alan Shepard. You can go check that out. But after that event, NASA had to reevaluate the whole hold it method and they came up with a new method, the just put it in a bag method. In later Mercury missions, the astronauts were fitted with sort of a, a giant latex condom or a latex cuff that would wrap around their, their stuff. They were all men, of course. The latex cuff was connected to a tube, valve clamp, and collection bag, and they leaked a lot, which is not good around electronic equipment. The Mercury missions weren't long enough for poop to be part of the issue, but in Gemini missions, when they were up there for much longer, they had to find a solution for that. And for that, they came up with, again, a bag solution that sort of sealed to the astronaut's butt where they could contain it and keep it from floating around Apollo 10 style. And these bags were filled with a type of bactericide, uh, so the astronauts would poop into it, seal it up, and then sort of knead it around with this bactericide to sort of st stabilize the feces. And to make this whole process more malleable, uh, they used low residue foods and sometimes laxatives before the launch. But hey, some astronauts said that kneading the poo wasn't that bad because it was, it was nice and warm. And to make it even weirder, NASA actually kept track and detailed all of the poops that they made on those Apollo missions. The largest one was on Apollo 9. So the bag system was used all the way through Apollo, but there's one place where you can't attach a bag or you don't have access to uh, a bag to attach, and that is when you're in a spacesuit on the moon. For that, NASA developed a pair of undershorts with layers of absorbent material, which stored both number one and number two, which means an astronaut very likely was looking up at the Earth while taking a pee or a dump. That is quite an experience. Bucket list experience. And at the end of the Apollo missions, NASA had left behind 96 bags of human poop on the moon. So, flags, footprints, feces. In fact, there are plans to someday go back and, and collect that and take a look at it and see if there's any bacteria or fungi that may have survived all that time on the moon. Now, after we landed on the moon, both the United States and Russia turned towards space stations. Russia with the Salyut and the Mir space stations, and the U.S. with Skylab. And the whole point of a space station is long duration space flights. And uh, for that, you gotta have some kind of good permanent solution for the poo. But the Skylab missions were basically like the Apollo missions. They would collect them in bags and then hold on to them for freeze drying and maybe even studying later on. But before they put the Skylab toilet up in Skylab, they had to test it here on Earth and they wanted to make sure that it would work in zero gravity. So they actually put it on a vomit comet and let it simulate weightlessness in the sky. I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty impressive when you think about it. The space shuttle toilets were a lot more impressive, a lot more sophisticated, but still pretty difficult to use. It had a four inch toilet hole, which is quite a bit smaller than what you're used to. And the space shuttle program was the first American program to have women on board. So of course that came with some challenges and some adaptations that had to be made to the system. And also during the shuttle era, they put a lot more effort into the undergarments that they could use while on spacewalks and whatnot. And interestingly, they're kind of running out of those. 
Yeah, apparently the company that manufactures these undergarments uh, closed up shop and NASA bought thousands of them before they went out of business. But um, each astronaut apparently has three of them on their missions. So that basically gets us caught up to today, but still we don't really have a long-term solution for reuse or recycling of solid waste matter. In The Martian, Mark Watney had to use his own feces to, to fertilize the ground in which he grew potatoes that kept him alive. And ultimately on a Mars colony or some kind of long-term um, solar system type journey, we would need some kind of closed loop system like that. But what would that look like? First of all, they need to sterilize the solid waste. Uh, because solid waste does carry pathogens that can infect and cause problems with other people. There may need to be some kind of new genetically altered bacteria that could generate useful products out of the solid waste that could be used on Mars, assuming again that planting in the ground is the right way to go. You know, other options like hydroponics and aeroponics might be a better solution, and some have even suggested things like fungi might be a type of superfood for astronauts on Mars. And with advances in synthetic beef, it could be possible that our solid waste could be broken down by bacteria into organic molecules that could then be, you know, kind of recombined into a type of meat. Or to paraphrase a certain astronaut, yesterday's filet mignon could be tomorrow's filet mignon. And on top of our solids, our liquids are very valuable. Humans produce 100 to 150 gallons of liquid waste per year. And that liquid waste contains things like nitrogen and phosphorus, which is good for growing plants. So right now, Perseverance is on Mars, and one of the things it's gonna be doing is taking samples of the soil to determine whether or not it is actually something that could be fertilized with our solid waste or whatever we might make from our solid waste to plant things on Mars. So it could very well be that the first thing that starts the terraforming process is our own poop. So it may turn out that the future has been behind us this whole time. Cleaning up after and feeding us meat bags are some of the biggest challenges that we have with long-term space travel and, and future planetary colonization. And if you want to get a better idea of what goes into preparing a meal for astronauts in space, I can highly recommend this show, Heston's Dinner in Space, which you can find on CuriosityStream. Heston Blumenthal is a British celebrity chef who takes on the challenge of preparing a gourmet meal for the ISS with the help of his friend, astronaut Tim Peake. By watching their journey, we learn about the unique challenges of creating food designed for space flight as they put on the first dinner party in space. This is, of course, just one of thousands of documentary series you can find on CuriosityStream from some of the best documentary filmmakers from around the world. It was created by the guys behind the Discovery Channel, so you know it's carrying on a good tradition. Plus, when you sign up for CuriosityStream, you get free access to Nebula, the streaming service that I'm a part of, as well as many of your other favorite science communicators like Trace Dominguez, who did a series on the past and future of space travel through his show Uno Dose of Trace, my buddy Isaac Arthur, and many more. You can watch all their content ad-free, and it's all in one place. And there's also a Nebula original series that you can only watch on Nebula, including the series from yours truly, called Mysteries of the Human Body, where we explore unexplained diseases and epidemics and other weird things about the bodies we inhabit. We're a couple of episodes in so far, and there's plenty to come, so go check it out if you haven't. And you get Nebula for free when you sign up for CuriosityStream, and right now they're offering 26% off, making it a grand total of $14.79 for those two streaming services for an entire year. It's amazing. So if you're curious, just go over to curiositystream.com slash Joe Scott to get started. Now it's seriously the best streaming deal on the planet. I use and enjoy both services, so I think you will too. So yeah, it's curiositystream.com slash Joe Scott. Go check it out. All right, big thanks to CuriosityStream for supporting this video and a huge shout out to the Patreon supporters on Patreon, the answer files who are uh, keeping this channel alive and, and were gracious with their time and patient with me as I took a little time off, which means I'm way behind on calling people out. So let me get to it. We got Levi Winters, Fishtail Productions, Joseph Davis, Robert Johnson, Devron Unail, I think, uh, Tom Novak, Robert Hummel, Shiraz Malik, Stephen Giliorakinis, <laughs> Anna Carvalho, Joseph Foley, Nothan, Nolan LeBlanc, uh, Kevin Hurst, Mark Hoffman, David Ocker, Dan Swinehart, Bristol Dormany, uh, Joshua Forsyth, Poscone, Romeo Joy, and Shannon H. Thank you guys so much. If you'd like to join them, get early access to videos, exclusive live streams, and all the other kinds of goodies, and just join a really cool community, you can go to patreon.com slash answers with Joe. Please do like and share this video if you liked it, and if this is your first time here, uh, maybe check out this video, because Google thinks you'll like it. And if you do like it, you want to check out some more, I invite you to go look at them. And if you enjoy them, uh, I invite you to subscribe. I come back with videos every Monday. All right, that's it for now. You guys go out there and have an eye-opening week. Stay safe, and I'll see you next Monday. Love you guys. Take care.